For a little while in my life, I was enamored with the apologists, the Christian apologists, who give good reason for our faith as Christians. Why on earth do we believe things that sound so incredible to those who are not of the same persuasion that a man could be born of God, that a man could die and be resurrected, that a person could be born again. These are all on a rational level, on a surface level of interpretation, absurd and illogical. So the Christian apologists set about uh, as their lives work to explain these things and explain why they are reasonable things to believe. People like C.S. Lewis of old, whom I highly respect. People like Robbie Zacharias of our day, whom I also respect, not as much as C.S. Lewis, but well, uh, what can I say about that? It might be because C.S. Lewis is departed. Therefore, he has an aura of uh, mystery around him. <laughs> about what was I talking about? Apologists. So for a while, I was enamored with the apologists. And then I began to realize that they always try to make things sound reasonable. And then I began to think that doesn't that mean that the highest value in their worldview is reason, rational thought? Isn't that an enlightenment value? It's a value of the enlightenment when people put away their uh, superstitions and their blind loyalties to a feudal lord, etc., etc., and sought to figure things out by reasoning them out and having a good reason for everything. The Enlightenment, which gave birth to our modern scientific worldview. So I began to see that the apologists, by and large, had as the highest value the intellect, the rational thought, which is an important thing, but it, uh, how can I put it? It's a ladder that falls short of heaven. You can explain everything fully, but it still doesn't make sense. Like the idea of the question of why would a living God create a hell? And in order to make sense of that, the apologist might say that a person that is corrupt in his heart is hell-bent and to put him in hell is an act of mercy because if this person with his corrupt hell-bent heart were to spend an eternity in heaven with a holy God he would be so uncomfortable he, he would wish he were dead and so God out of his mercy puts this hell-bent person in hell and that sounds really great <laughs> I mean what a great explanation. And it, it explains it perfectly. But it doesn't make sense. It's cold comfort for anybody who's been told that they are dearly departed, has gone to hell. Are you going to tell them this explanation, this, this logical reasoning of why God sent them to hell out of His great mercy and love? So it makes sense, but it doesn't explain anything. Or you could say it explains everything away, but it makes no sense. Let's just look at the Gospels, the uh, pre-enlightenment, pre-Western thought. The stories of the old way, the Hebraic culture, it's so different from the Greek, which began to grow in the New Testament times, which now has borne fruit in our current uh, Western worldview of rational thoughts, born out of the 
out of the midwifery of the Enlightenment. Look at the story. In the Gospels, it said that the sinners were attracted to Jesus. So much so that the holy people, the priests and ministers of their day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, criticized him, they mocked him, they said, why do you? Why, why he, they said to his disciples, why does your master eat with sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes? Why does he mix with this kind of undesirable element? He gained a reputation as a drunkard, a party animal, and a friend of sinners. So you can see that these sinners, the dregs of society, the outcasts, who were so shunned by the religious elite and obviously had no desire to go and party with the religious elites, not that the religious elite would party anyway. They were drawn to Jesus like moths to a flame. So this does not jive with the idea that a sinner condemned to an eternity in heaven, would wish he were dead. Doesn't really jive. And this is the reason that I do not put so much value on apologetics, though I'm grateful that it exists. This is the reason that I no longer engage in drawn out debates and arguments with people. It might give the impression that I am anti-intellectual, which I am not, or that I am non-intellectual, which I am not. I do enjoy thinking, thought experiments, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the reason that I do not engage in them or put the bulk of my emotions and value on them is because they are not the path to the kingdom of God. It can be fun. It certainly is a path to something, but it falls short of the kingdom. The first message that Jesus preached is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is and has always been the primary message of the gospel. And that repentance is not about making you feel bad about yourself. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is metanoia. To think above or to think again or to rethink. But it is not just a thinking of the intellect rational mind. It is your belief. Belief something different. Belief something higher. Accept a different truth because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, higher thoughts and higher truths when brought down to a lower level of abstraction, should make sense at a lower level of abstraction. But that's not what it's about. Truth is not just about the lower levels of abstraction, like helping an old lady across the street, not telling lies, don't steal your neighbor's fruits. Those are all good things, but that's not all that truth is about. Truth is something that's higher and above us and beneath us and all about us and within us and outside us. Eventually it's paradox and that's why it always comes back to at the end of uh, the story, the last mile of delivery, it always comes down to a mystical action. 
like Jesus said, come to me. Our minds can't understand that. So we try to interpret that in different ways, like self-flagellation, like prayers and fasting, like Bible study, like giving of alms. All of these are good things, but they are lower level abstractions of a divine truth that is almost impossible to explain. Come to me, Christ said. And you can do all these good activities and good practices, which will help you come to Christ. But eventually, you will not know whether you have come to Christ until you have come to Christ. And then you will know that you have. So, paradox, mysticism, don't worry about it. Just do it. Just be. And you will be who you are.